Welcome. Welcome everyone to our webinar, Technology for Family Engagement in Early Learning Settings. I'm Susan Hope Bard, the online training producer here at TechSoup, and we are really excited for you to join us today. We are proud to partner with the Early Learning Lab for a series of webinars during this year. Um, we do want this webinar and all of the presentations to be relevant to the important work you do with young children. So in advance, I'd like to thank you for answering our registration questions and also our survey questions at the end of today's event. This helps us better understand your needs. We know that many of you may be new to TechSoup, and we hope that you'll join us for other live events and take advantage of our other online resources. So again, please don't forget to complete our survey at the end of the webinar. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about the platform that you're using. Um, it's called ReadyTalk. In the lower left-hand corner, there's a chat box. And at any time during the presentation, you should feel free to let us know if you have any problems hearing the audio or viewing the slides. We can address those questions through the chat box. The chat box is also for your questions. We will be flagging your questions and queuing them for later review during our Q&A session, which comes at the end of the event. So if you are chatting in during the event questions and you're not getting an immediate response, don't worry. We're going to try to address everyone's questions at the end. Also keep in mind, if we don't get to your question, it's okay. We're going to be putting together a question and answer document. All of our expert presenters will be helping us create that document. So you'll receive that after the event when we post uh, the recording to our website. If you registered more than about an hour ago, you can also um, access the PowerPoint that I'm going to be sharing with you today. If you lose your internet connection, you can reconnect using the link in your registration or that reminder email. If you're hearing an echo through your computer speakers right now or having any issues with the audio, you can dial in using the toll-free line listed in your registration email. Just so you know, we are recording this event. It's going to be important for us to record this and post this on our website. We have a webinar page. This is where we share all of our webinar recordings and announce upcoming events. And you should check it out, www.techsoup.org slash community slash events dash webinars. You can also review our recorded webinars and videos on our YouTube channel. And that's www.youtube.com slash TechSoup video. In a few days, you'll receive an email with a link to this presentation, uh, Q&A document, and any collateral information which could be in the form of attachments from one of our partners. Generally, we try to get that to you in about a week or sooner. If you're following along with us on Twitter, you can tweet us at TechSoup or use hashtag TSWebinars. It is really a pleasure uh, for me and TechSoup to be able to introduce you to some of our presenters today. Um, we are proud to partner with the Early Learning Lab. And Chatal Singh is the Director of Design and Innovation. And she works to build the capacity for innovation and the use of new technologies for preschools and community-based organizations. And she works primarily with children birth to five. Her work at the lab builds on about 15 years of experience in digital media and technology to solve social problems. Dr. Elena Lopez is an Associate Director at Harvard Family Research Project. Her research focuses on the relationships between families, schools, and communities as they relate to children's development and education. Elena seeks to increase the usability of research in practice and teacher education. She's team taught courses on family, school, and community educational engagement at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. She was a governing board member of both the National Association for the Education of Young Children and the Parent Services Project. Sandra Gutierrez is the founder and national director of Abriendo Puertas, or Opening Doors. Sandra led the development of Abierto Puertas, the nation's first evidence-based comprehensive training program for Latino parents for children birth to five. Before that, Sandra developed a series of training programs to support children and families involved in the child welfare system for parents 
Action for Children. She has over 40 years of experience. Rebecca Parlakian serves as the Director of Parenting Resources at Zero to Three. She developed resources like apps, web-based resources, DVDs, and more for parents, and she trains parents and early childhood professionals. Rebecca has co-authored three parenting education curricula and has published articles on topics ranging from dual language development to best practices for building relationships with families. However, her most important and satisfying lab work in child development is with her two children, Ella and Dennett. As I mentioned, my name is Susan Hope Bard. I'm the online training producer. And also assisting us today in the background is Becky Wiegand, and she is our webinar manager here at TechSoup. So let me talk a bit about our objectives today. Today we hope to be able to share the latest research on the technology habits of millennial parents. We want to discuss a framework to guide program providers in using technology with modern families. And third, we want to highlight lessons learned from families' use of technology with young children. And of course, we do want to answer your questions. I'm going to talk a little bit about TechSoup. We are located in San Francisco, California. And right now, we want to know where you are coming from. So let's practice using the chat box. While I talk about TechSoup, chat to us out here where you are from, the city and state, or if you are from another country. And as you are doing that, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about TechSoup. We are a 501c3 nonprofit like many of you joining us today. We work to empower organizations around the world to help them get the latest tools, skills, and resources. We want to help you achieve your mission. You can see from our map here, let me go back, that we serve almost every country in the world. The need is global, and we do have a dedicated website for countries outside of the U.S. at www.techsoup.global. We've helped organizations get more than $5.2 billion in technology products and grants to non-governmental organizations around the world. These technology products and grants come from more than 100 corporate and foundation partners. Wow, I see a lot of folks coming here. Oh, St. Louis, Seattle, California, Rhode Island. Wow, lots of oh, Santa Fe, one of my favorite places to go. We've got folks from all around the country here today. Thank you so much for joining us. And now, and now I do want to take our first live poll. So this will be an opportunity for you to tell us, is this your first TechSoup webinar? You can actually click in yes or no. And if you are not sure or if you can't click in, you can simply answer in the chat box. And we've got some super fast fingers. And we have about 500 folks on the conference call and webinar right now. So I'll give everyone about 5 more seconds. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right, I'm going to close the poll, but it does look like the majority of you, this is your first time to a TechSoup webinar. So I would like to extend a very special and appreciative thank you to coming to this webinar. We hope you'll come to many more. And I would like to transition this to Chatal from the Early Learning Lab, and she'll be able to introduce you and talk a little bit about the Early Learning Lab. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. So I am Chatal Singh. I'm the Director of Design and Innovation at the Early Learning Lab. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our organization and about this webinar series that we put together for the early childhood education field in partnership with TechSoup the Harvard Family Research Project, the Joan Gantz Cooney Center, Frontiers of Innovation out of the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard, New America, and New Profit. So about the lab first, we're a fairly new organization and we're, we're small. Um, we're a nonprofit based in Oakland, California. And our mission is to support the early childhood education field by identifying developing and catalyzing the use of innovative tools, 
program design, and technologies to foster great caregiving and teaching of children from birth to five. All of our work is informed by a set of practices that early childhood researchers have identified as being the most important practices for the adults in the lives of children to do. Now, our goal is to identify program design elements that foster these practices and build an evidence base for what works, ultimately informing policy so we can really scale what works throughout the country. And as I mentioned, um, technology, we do believe that technology plays an important role in fostering innovation for the early childhood field. And that accelerating the use of innovative technology really does require working at three levels. Now, often people talk about supply and demand. We also think that capacity building is a very important element, and it's really the base of the pyramid here. Um, this webinar series that we're producing is one of our capacity building efforts for the field uh, to help to guide the field in understanding how to meaningfully integrate technology into their programs. We sent out a, a survey in January and February of this year. And in the survey, which was really a technology needs assessment, we asked members of the, the field where they see the most promise for technology in their work what they're struggling with in terms of technology, and what they want to learn about. Now, the, the answers from that survey are um, currently being analyzed. And we're going to be releasing a report next month, which um, you know, we'll be sharing with the field widely. But preliminary analysis of the results really led us to decide to produce this webinar series. So there were four topics that really bubbled to the surface. Technology for family engagement was one of them, and that's why we, part with our partners and our content partners, have just put this webinar together for you today. But there were um, additional topics that surfaced, and these include teaching young children with technology, the use of data to inform professional development for teachers, and the use of data for program evaluation. So those three remaining topics we will be um, presenting in, in the webinar training over the course of 2016. And we plan to work with TechSoup and our other partners to produce about one webinar per quarter. So we sincerely hope that you'll come back to join us for those webinars as well. Um, but in addition to the capacity building, we are also working at both the supply and the demand side. On the demand side, we are really working to help program implementers and families understand the range of tools available and help them make smart decisions about which tools to use and how to use them. And then on the supply side, we are in the process of working with technologists to ensure that products that are being developed are research-based and they're really meeting the needs of the field. And as I said, they're really fostering those practices that we think are so important for adults and the lives of children to do. And part of this work involves defining and testing what we call high-value technology design elements. So I'm going to jump ahead to those design elements um, and just to give you a sense of the type of work that we're doing, based on a preliminary survey of how technology is currently being used in the early learning field and which products and programs seem to be the most successful, we've proposed a list of preliminary design elements that we think are important when it comes to developing new technologies to really make sure that we're embedding um, these elements for successful technologies. And some of these include building the self-efficacy of the user, whether it's a parent or a teacher or an administrator, building social capital for the user, putting data in the hands of users, and using data to inspire improvement. And the data can range from student information to the number of conversational turns or words that a child is hearing over the course of the day. It really varies, but we think that people should, um, should know what they're aiming for. And then um, you know, personalization is obviously um, leading to greater, self, greater efficacy of, of technologies. And then we definitely believe that technology should accommodate and promote diversity. So um, 
having said that and giving you a little sense of what we're up to at the Early Learning Lab, I have to say that I'm thrilled that we have been able to work with Zero to Three, Harvard Family Research Project, and Alcriento Portes, and of course TechSoup, to put this very first webinar together. And with that, I am going to hand it over to Rebecca from Zero to Three to um, share with us some of the research they've been doing on millennial parents. Hi everyone, this is Rebecca, and I'm really excited to share with you uh, the recent project that we uh, endeavored to uh, take the lead on when it came to getting to know millennial parents. And so we got really interested in the idea of how millennials are approaching parenting because they have been in the news an awful lot the last few years. And frequently those headlines are not so positive when it comes to millennials. And so we really began to ask, <clears throat> is the millennial experience of parenting all that different? And are millennials looking for parenting and child rearing information and messaging in different ways uh, than uh, parents of other generations? So just to have, so that we share a definition of millennials, they are um, adults who were born between 1977 and 1998 roughly. There's about 75 million of them, and they, uh, millennials are, account for about 80% of the births that are happening uh, today. So they are the majority of today's parents of children under the age of five. So what we did is we did both a series of focus groups with parents, and these focus groups were incredibly diverse when it came to ethnicity. We also did focus groups, some in English, some in Spanish, and we did some focus groups with dads and some with moms. And then we paired that qualitative research with a quantitative component where we uh, did a, a survey of parents as well. And one of the, we asked a variety of questions, but one of the questions we asked was, you know, how parents um, access child rearing and parenting information. And millennial parents, more than any others, um, because there were some Gen Xers in our survey as well, um, millennials overwhelmingly reported turning to technology more than other parenting groups. Um, and that included texting um, for many, many of the parents. But the number one uh, place that parents turned were Google searches. Um, and for those of us who were in the field of early childhood, that's maybe a little scary to contemplate because the first three hits on Google are not always maybe the best resources. Um, so we want to be sure that what parents are accessing when they turn to Google or turn to any of these technology-based resources, they're getting really the highest quality information they can. And that kind of led to our next, oh, I'm sorry, um, and I forgot that we are doing some interactivity here to ask you how you like to communicate with families. So for this portion, you can click any of these modalities that you use to communicate, and then just click Submit. Okay, so it looks like we have about 175 responses, and now we're up to almost 300. And I guess I'll close the survey in about five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Answer now or forever hold your peace. So, Email by far the most common modality, um, and social media for many of us, and texting is a really important modality for parents. And we're going to um, touch very briefly today on why that is and what came out in our survey uh, regarding texting. Um, Information in general for millennial parents was a double-edged sword. Parents overwhelmingly said that they were overwhelmed. There was so much information about child rearing and parenting that they really weren't sure who to trust and which source was the right one. Um, and at the same time, um, parents also said that they didn't just take the word of experts you know, at 
you know, at face value, that they felt like what experts were saying were was important, but that, you know, unless someone really knew their particular family and their particular child, that the information to a certain extent had limited relevance. So those were some of the challenges that bubbled up with regard to technology. Um, when we asked parents, you know, how do you want to receive your messages and what, you know, how do you want those messages framed, there were three themes that came through. And one was that parents said a lot of times the messaging they receive feels really simplistic and sometimes condescending. And they were looking for messages that truly validated how tough parenting is. They, they find parenting joyful, but it's really hard work and it's really complicated and complex. And they wanted messages that acknowledge that. Secondly, um, parents really had a strong desire to have their voices heard and to contribute their voices to help other parents. So they wanted to be treated as equal partners in messaging and in um, creating an approach that really worked for their family. And then finally, Parents wanted information when they wanted it and how they wanted to access it just in time, like just at the time that they need it. And that kind of led to their feeling that texting um, and other technology-based solutions worked really well for them because it was at their fingertips, literally. And on that note, we wanted you to stay tuned and keep us at your fingertips at 0to3.org because the quantitative results of our survey of 2,200 parents of children under the age of 5 will be uh, released in partnership with Room and the Bezos Family Foundation and our media partner, PBS, in early May for a, a Mother's Day launch. And, and in that release, we'll be covering all of our major findings, including how parents are using technology to access um, information about child rearing. So that's it for me. Uh, thank you so much, and I'll look forward to answering any of your questions. Thank you, Rebecca. And everyone, just as a quick reminder, you can chat in your questions into the chat box at any time during this presentation. We're queuing them up so that about 10 of the hour we'll be taking those queued questions and we'll be asking our panel of experts. So feel free to do that throughout the time we have today. I'm going to next introduce our, our next speaker, which is Dr. Elena Lopez. Hello everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to share with you this afternoon a framework on using technology and digital media uh, in family engagement. Um, next slide please. Rebecca just shared with us that parents want to be respected form partners and that they really want um, providers, whether you're early childhood educators or librarians, to understand the complexity and reality of parenting. So let's take a look at how one early childhood program uses digital media for and with parents and families. Comienza en Casa is an early childhood project of a nonprofit organization serving rural Mexican migrant workers in Maine. The goal of Comienza is to provide opportunities for parents to support their children's learning and in their home language so that children are prepared for school. Um, the project has five different components, but the key one being the intentional use of an iPad as an educational tool so that parents can use it with their children at times that are convenient for them. There is a training for families to use, to learn how to use the iPad, and also to share um, the curriculum and its learning objectives. There are monthly evening meetings uh, that engage children and families in fun and learning activities. And in between these monthly meetings, there are home visits where a home visitor checks on a child's progress, but also listens to parent observations and parent suggestions. So the whole program then is um, meant to enable families to be agents in their children's success. Um, that is to use the iPad not just to read and do math, but also to be able to document, create, and explore projects with children. 
Next slide, please. So Great. And before yeah. I show the um, slide, Elena, is there, you may want to just adjust your mic a little tiny bit so that you're a little tiny bit louder for the folks. Okay. Yeah. All right. And I'm, gonna, I'm ready to go advance to the next slide. All right. So here's a story about one kindergarten kid who went through the Comienza project and after a kindergarten class trip to a blueberry farm, came home and told his mom, I need to make a book about blueberries. So he made drawings about how blueberries grow and photographed them using the camera on his iPad and added his voice using a digital storytelling app. Mm -hmm. So let's look at his creation of mm -hmm. um, this video and then clip. I'll go here to give you the and then Susan, can you start the video clip? How Berries Go is read by Jalen Rodriguez Best. The first thing you need a seed. Then you need a hot sun. Then you water the seed. Then the seed grows more bigger and is ready to eat. Okay. Could everyone was everyone was okay to hear that? All right. So when the kindergarten teacher saw this um, digital story, she started providing opportunities for children in her class to create similar projects. So I think this is an example of how families can contribute to classroom changes. And also it demonstrates how children and families can make that leap from being consumers to producers of their own learning. And in this case, everyone is a learner, including the kindergarten teacher who found this an inspiring way to share with her entire classroom. The Comienza story is important because it provides a clear link between what the program wants families to learn and do what the families desire for their children and the use of digital technology to serve this purpose. Next slide, please. Um, today when we have um, so many apps and games and videos at one's disposal, we can get mesmerized by the technology. And what we want to do is to avoid random acts of technology and digital media. Early childhood providers need to be intentional about how and why they are using digital media yeah, with families. Question. Next slide, please. So one important guide is the Head Start Parent, Family, and Community Engagement Framework, which lays out the program foundations for establishing a um, technology and digital media initiative. So let's start with the program foundations. Next slide, please. So digital technology can be seen as a tool that expands options to support families in their children's learning and literacy development, connect families to one another and to community services and resources, and to create pathways for continuous family engagement across different learning spaces such as libraries, museums, parks, and maker spaces. And so the foundations of leadership, professional development, and assessment and improvement should be geared towards these three aspects of how digital uh, technology and media can be used. To give one example, for professional development, it's not just about training early childhood educators, librarians, and others who work with families of young children to use the technology, but it's also about the relationship with families in the use of technology. I think going back to what Rebecca said, um, trust was important for families. Uh, in terms of policy, it's about the leadership and the management, giving families a voice and opportunity to co-develop policies. Policies, for example, like bringing home tablets or determining what an respectful partnership would look like. Next. Thank you. 
Elena, before we move to the next slide, I just want to make sure that everyone that is um, one of our partners speaking today is on mute, just because there is some background noise coming through, and I want to make sure. Excellent. Thank you. My apologies. So the next aspect of the framework is about what we call program impact areas, or what is known as your program services. Next slide, please. And there are four components to this. The first one being establishing a program environment that reflects an inviting space uh, with participation via multiple media. That is not just your tablets or your cell phones, but also arts and crafts and books, and creating an environment which is inviting for an individual's own learning, like a parent's own learning, or learning with a child, or even learning with other families. Um, in terms of teaching and learning, I think um, Shital brought out some important design elements to consider, that is, as parents, as co-creators, and partners. And I think it's also important for early childhood educators to understand the environment in which children and families use digital media, and that is, building on what families already know and what they observe. And it's very possible that even older kids in a family are the ones who help parents who may lack language or technical fluency. So all of these factors have to be considered so that educators can really play their role as um, media mentors and facilitators. So the, with the idea of family partnership, it begins with learning and understanding how families use and want to use digital media. Going back to the survey that Rebecca shared with us, we understand that families want to be respected. They want the information to be grounded in the realities and complexities of um, parenting and not just some ideal version. So I think all of this means that educators should try to build empathy, putting oneself in the place of parents and considering what is desirable and what is possible. And lastly, community partnerships are important, uh, and they are developed so that early childhood programs are aligned with the work, with the goals and activities of other agencies in the community. And what you see here in your slide is an interesting collaboration among the Massachusetts Department of um, Early Learning and Care, the uh, United Way, and the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority. And their common goal was to get parents understanding the importance of brain development and learning happens anywhere and anytime, and putting ads like this and providing tips um, in subway trains and supplementing that with a website with lots of resources for parents as well as for the early childhood providers. Next slide, please. So lastly, we come to the family engagement outcomes. And I know that most of us are familiar with you know, outcomes related to families engaging in children's literacy and learning, but there's a whole range of outcomes also related to um, connecting parents and families with each other because research has shown that such connections contribute to um, family well-being, less depression, and even ways to overcome material hardship. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, uh, a slide before that. I think there's a missing slide. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to end with another story from Comienza, where we began. Where we began. And so the, um, through this program, the parents were introduced to the library and its resources, but the parents um, also felt that there were very few resources for adults in Spanish. And the parents then organized a fundraising event, and the library was able to acquire books and magazines and digital resources in Spanish for the parents. So I think this is a good example, again, of an outcome of making family connections contributing to the community well-being. Um, and our last slide, please. 
some points to remember, avoid random acts, be intentional, create strong foundations in terms of policy, professional development, know and understand families, encourage families to be wise consumers, but also encourage them to be avid creators with their children, and finally assess, improve, and innovate. So thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to share a framework with you about the use of family of technology and family engagement. Thank you. And I think the next slide just points to a couple of resources that you can access from our website. Thank you so much, Elena. And I want to just um, let everybody know not to worry. We are recording this webinar, and you will receive a link to the recording as well as all of the handouts, including the PowerPoints and resources, in roughly a week. So I just wanted to remind everyone, I see some folks chatting in, and I don't want anyone to worry about taking notes. You will receive all of this information. Okay. So yay. So. Um, for our next presenter, um, we have Sandra Gutierrez from Abriendo Puertas or Opening Doors. And I'm going to turn it over to Sandra next. Good day to everyone uh, participating in, the, in this webinar, and thank you for being a part of it. Uh, I'll start with a, just a very brief background on Abriendo Puertas Opening Doors. It's a program that was co-created by and for Latino parents with children 0 to 5. It honors and supports parents in their quest for a better future. As you can see, the byline, building a better future through parent leadership. Um, and we part from the very deeply held aspirations and dreams that parents have for their children to have a better future, to have more opportunities than they've had, and work to convert those aspirations and dreams into goals with real-time plans and real-time results. We believe strongly that parents have an unparalleled desire and an unmatched potential to improve child outcomes and to improve their quality of life. So that is where our investment begins. Um, I would like to start now to tell you a little bit about the, the journey, bumpy as it has been, with our, our development of an Avriendo Puertas app. First, why develop an Avriendo Puertas app? We were moved by the Pew um, re a Research Center report that uh, Latinos have the highest rate of smartphone, smartphone usage in the United States, um, and that they tend to use their smartphone as the main, the principal source of uh, internet use. Our program of the end of was developed seven years ago, and since then there's been a boom in technology. It's a new day. There are apps and, and games and uh, tablets for each and every use, so we wanted to stay relevant and provide parents support um, with the decision making that goes along with this new technology. We agree with uh, Dr. Lopez that learning happens everywhere and anytime, and we also believe that parents, what they do each and every day is of great consequences. This isn't our first um, engagement with technology. We've worked very proudly and very happily with the folks from Vroom that Rebecca mentioned. They have a wonderful app available in English and Spanish. In English it's Vroom and Spanish is Vroom. And it's a great app that is based on a lot of research. It's very well designed and it is uh, currently part of our curriculum and we encourage parents to use it. In addition to that, um, uh, we received feedback from parents about concern about this new reality of technology everywhere and use and overuse of technology. So a group of parents from Avriendo Puertas in Chicago developed some tech tips for parents. These are developed by parents for parents that are going to be part of the resource package that you'll be receiving later. Um, in addition to the tech tips, we are currently in the process of working with Common Sense Media to develop a session for Avriendo Puertas that navigates technology, what are the good uses of technology, and what to avoid, what are the best practices. Um, we have to begin always with parents in mind and the audience in mind. And, and the, the most important thing we did um, in the development of the app was to seek parent input. We spoke to 400 moms and dads throughout the country. 80% of them were Spanish speaking. Not all of them had participated in Abriendo Puertas opening doors. We encouraged parents to bring other parents that hadn't participated so we could get a, a greater, broader uh, input into what people wanted. 
Um, first off, there were some very consistent messages um, and uh, perception issues that were communicated. There was a deep, deep, very heartfelt concern about their children's use of technology, meaning that their overuse of technology. And they um, admitted in each and every focus group that they, uh, parents are often quick to let, give the child a tablet or, or hand them the phone to appease them or as a, as a quick fix for some situation. They were worried about the long-term consequences of that and wanted advice on, on best practices relate, related to that. Because most of the parents that we worked with um, speak Spanish, many are bilingual, and in the case of this, uh, the, of the input, we had 80% of the folks were Spanish speaking and the rest were bilingual. Um, there was a real fear, a very legitimate fear of that this new technology and how fast moving it was and how ever pervasive it was might create yet another distance for parents, that it might be another language that they don't speak, um, that this technology might be beyond their reach. Um, that said, uh, all of the, 80% of the participants rather, reported daily use with um, Facebook and with a WhatsApp, and that was primarily to stay in touch with their families here in the U.S. and, and abroad. Um, there was a deeply held, um, the overarching uh, sentiment of the focus groups and the feedback we got was that folks want to learn how to do this and how to do it right. They know that this is a new day and they don't want to stay behind. Hence the quote, que adelante no mira, atrás se queda. If you don't look forward, you stay behind. So there was a real hunger to try to figure out what's the best thing that they could do. Um, in terms of input for the app, we originally started with the idea that we would work with the uh, content that we already have in the Grindo Partes curriculum. Um, that was not a popular idea. Folks thought that the curriculum has a lot of interactive uh, activities and that a lot of the learning takes place as part of the discussion that takes place during the session, the social capital and peer-to-peer -peer discussion that happened. So we were discouraged from using the current content and the development of an app, but we received a very rich amount of feedback about what they would like in an app, what are the features and what are the the traits that they would want the app to have. I'll just give you the top three. The first, we heard this over and over, they recommend that the app be easy, useful, fun, and enjoyable. Easy, useful, fun, and enjoyable over and over. There was a very sound uh, um, opinions about it would be great if there was just one go-to resource, Mi Familia, that would help them with their kids from prenatal to 20 years old so that they wouldn't have to navigate and figure out the puzzle pieces of getting further information. And that does definitely make a lot of sense. Um, we were told time and time again to keep it real, to use real families, and I think this is congruent with some of Rebecca's comments, um, uh, to show um, and highlight families that are like them, that look like them, that have struggled like them and they encourage the use of videos instead of text-heavy documents um, and text-heavy content. Um, and so moving on to the top five, which I had a drum roll, recommendations regarding the content. The number one uh, area where folks wanted support was in stress. And this was a, we had a voting process and I can send you a, a, a report about what the vote count looked like, but stress was a, overwhelmingly first um, and most important area that they wanted support in. And that could be primarily because there's not a lot of, uh, first of all, because we're all stressed, but second, because there's not a lot of information in Spanish about what to do about stress in real life uh, situations. The second was bullying, and uh, those of us who have worked with parents understand that that is always a common concern, something very deeply held. In this case, we heard a lot of very painful testimony about children being bullied for not speaking English and the parent concerns about what to do and how to navigate that. The third um, content area was dual language learners. Folks were very comfortable with the advantages of being bilingual. They don't want to lose their native language. They know it's an asset, but there was a lot of questions and they wanted information about what are the best practices for dual language learners at home and in school? What rights do they have? What would help them succeed. There was a lot of concern about that. The fourth one surprised us because we thought there's a lot of other resources around around literacy, but it does coincide with a recent read alone uh, survey that said 40% of parents surveyed 
couldn't find the time to read to their children daily. The fifth one I uh, really uh, pleased us a great deal because they end up what this program is based on parent leadership and, and advocacy. Folks really understood that even if they read, talked, sang, and sent their kids to the to preschool, that they were there were going to be some challenges that they would face and they would need to know how to handle them. And these included what are the best practices and what are their rights in transitioning to kindergarten and to the school system, talking to teachers, school choice, and legal rights as immigrants. Very quickly, um, the sixth and seventh, which we will not get into, was connection to services and healthy um, and healthy recipes. There was a thought that we could include recipes and people can upload recipes of healthy uh, Latino cuisine so those can be shared via the app. We moved forward with what we had done from parents and then uh, selected a, a tech partner. And I have to tell you that the generational and cultural divide is real. There was a bit of a cultural clash. We worked with very young folks who grew up gaming, who are experts in gaming technology, and someone who shall remain nameless, a bit of a flintstone when, when, when it comes to, to tech. So I definitely could have been better prepared as we began this process. We did learn a lot. Uh, we had several reality checks, hence the rebooted assumptions and expectations. Um, we started off not understanding the functional limitations of smartphones, and so we developed uh, um, ideas that had a lot of bells and whistles that perhaps could not work on a smartphone. And we quickly learned that expertise matters. We were first advised that any smart college kid could do this for you, and we tried that for several months and uh, realized that that is not the case. We had to work in stages. There were several iterations of the app. Um, and I have to say that because of the gaming background of our tech partners, we wanted to make sure that no one was hurt or exploded in the, in the course of developing the AP apps. Uh, a lot of the gaming um, features were, have that as part of uh, winning and competing in terms of a game. And uh, we wanted to stay true to the strength-based and welcoming environment of uh, Rio de Puerto, given that it is a uh, Parenting is so very personal and, and so very cultural. Um, but um, there are some uh, funny uh, iterations of the app that I'd love to share with you at some point. Um, now, drum roll to the storyboard of the prototype uh, of the app. As you can see, the first photo is of us getting a lot of uh, input from parents uh, about the process. To the side of that is uh, there where you can see the app on the phone, on the mobile device, and you can click to the splash screen, which will have a daily joke of the day, a daily affirmation, and a daily tip. Next on the first, uh, you see the videos um, of, um, the, well, the screen where you can access the videos, which really is the heart and soul of the of app, and a connection to GPS so that um, folks can easily find some services that they may be interested in, including libraries, preschool recreational areas. We've developed, along with parents and some of our team leaders, two games. One is Abriendo Puertas Loteria that we've been using successfully for the last seven years. We updated it to an app format. And the other is a new uh, soccer game that explores the myths and realities of, uh, of child development. We're really excited. We know that it's a new day, and uh, there's a lot of great talent in the tech field, and there's a lot a very profound interest in education and we await a lot of great new resources that will soon be developed. We want to thank um, the, our friends from TechSoup and from the Early Learning Lab for creating a safe and welcoming space for us to discuss these issues and move forward so that we can better support and honor the families. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. That was awesome. All of the presenters, that was fabulous. Um, we, have, we have lots of opportunity now for questions, and I see in our question queue we've got quite about 27 questions. So let's see if we'll be able to get to these. And I believe the first few will be for Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca, a few people are wondering about the types of video conferencing platforms that parents use, or how many parents use those video conferencing platforms like Skype. 
Yeah, I saw that question, and it's a great one. We did not ask parents specifically about video conferencing platforms. I wish we had. That would have been a good addition. Um, so 2020 hindsight, we would have added that. I do know from other work at Zero to Three that a lot of families are using video conferencing platforms, especially military families, to stay in touch with um, parents who are deployed. But with regard to this survey, we did not include it. Thank you. Um, there are a few folks that would love to get um, more information about the research instruments you used and that particular survey. And I saw you chatting out to some folks about the upcoming survey. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So. The survey instrument itself will likely be part of one of the documents or one of the assets that will be released at the launch, which will be the first week of May. And for those of you who are interested in um, getting the results, you can visit 0to3.org or follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Um, and you know, you'll certainly see the results there on social media. Thank you. Um, someone would like some advice or your best advice on how to research or reach, reach families that have lower literary, literacy while being sensitive to their needs but not be condescending. Yeah, that was a hard one to answer in the chat, and I think it's such a balance, and I think our other speakers today really have made such strides in this as well, so I encourage them to jump in. But um, I feel as though you know, our approach, we try to at first always validate the parent's experience. So you know, for example, dealing with temper tantrums rather than you know, saying, here are the three steps to handling a temper tantrum, which as a parent of a very intense child, like, you know, it's more like here are the 97,000 steps to handle a temper tantrum. So um, you know, we try to start off by validating the parent's experience. Like temper tantrums can really drive you crazy, and that's okay. You're allowed to have feelings, but it's what you do with those feelings that really matters for your child and what they're learning. And then and giving parents ideas to think about. So, you know, giving parents the idea that, you know, kids are allowed to be angry and frustrated, but it's up to us to teach them the okay ways to express that. Um, that might be an idea that you give parents to think about and then say some parents find it's useful to teach their child to punch the couch cushions or rip newspaper to get the mad out. You know, you can, you can you know, use one of those ideas or one that works well for your family. So really acknowledging that there aren't any simple answers, but here are some things to think about and here are some things that have worked for other parents. And then really try and engage them in a discussion. Thank you. Um, I think this question is for you, Rebecca, but Chattel or any of the other presenters can chime in. Are there national standards for the use of technology that these folks can use for curriculum planning and to share with families? Wow, that did not was not encompassed in our survey, so I'm not sure I'd be the best person to respond to that. But I'd love to hear what others think. Uh, this is Elena. Um, the um, National Association for the Education of Young Children and the Fred Rogers Center came up with a position statement regarding technology. So it's not exactly standards, but it's principles and um, solidly backed by the research that we have to date. Thank you so much, Elena. And, um, um, this this is she oh, <laughs> sorry, this is Sheetal. I just wanted to jump in with another resource that um, might be helpful in terms of thinking about the use of digital media and technology with young children. And that's um, a new research that is coming out of the Jogant Kuni Center and a book that was recently published um, called Click, Tap, Read, or Tap, Click, Read, um, which was written by Michael Levine and Lisa Guernsey. So you may want to check that out as well. They have a website, and we included it on our resource list. So um, you'll get that with the post-event email. 
Yes, and it was also attached to everyone's reminder email, and we will be sure to include that research page with that link. And there's a, a bunch of – there's an amazing array of resources on that page if you, if you haven't had a chance to look at that uh, yet. Folks on the webinar, you should check that out. Um, the next few questions look like they're for Elena. And if I'm incorrect, presenters, please chime in. Um, Elena, how long has the Comienza program been going? I think it's been going for at least five or six years. And um, the question that I often get is how is it funded? They use the Federal uh, Migrant Education Funds. Great. Thank you. One other question was about the term you used, random acts. Could you talk a little bit more about what you mean? Um, by random acts, um, you know, we mean that with the ease with which um, you know, apps and other uh, forms of digital media are available, that they are used. Um, we would like to see the use of that digital platforms in relation to um, the purposes and learning objectives of a, um, a program and to think about them as you would consider any other type of platform, whether digital or not. How does this contribute to engaging families in their children's learning? What, are, what can we expect or what would we like to see as desired results? Also, do we have the capacity? Is it something that is feasible within the resources of an early childhood program? And um, what does this mean then? How do we engage families as decision makers in the use of this technology and platform? Thank you, Elena. Uh, the next couple of questions, uh, Sandra, I believe this question is about your app. Um, some folks are wondering about tracking the use of the app, if you have any metrics that you can share on who is using it. Not yet. I uh, did want to add that we are still in the prototype phase. The name of the app is Favre a Favre, and we're working to get the prototype so it does have some rudimentary analytics uh, to it. We hope to have it up on our website soon so that folks can interact with it and provide feedback. It will be free. It will be available in Spanish and in English. It's, it's not uh, fully um, completed yet because we're taking it slow and steady based on the feedback that we're, we're receiving. I uh, also wanted to add that part of innovation is getting used to things not working and, and having to edit. So because a lot of the Latino parents are smartphone dependent, uh, a lot of the – there may not be enough bandwidth for all the video uh, that we had originally intended. So we're – it's still a work in progress. It's in its infancy or toddler stage. Thank you. And some folks are wondering if it will be available on Android and um, iOS or – we're planning for both, and we're planning in English and in Spanish. Um, we're still working and still raising funds for the full development of the app. We want to be very careful and be very mindful of the feedback that we'll receive in the next six months as we roll this out for people to try. Um, if anybody's interested, please contact me and be happy to make it available for you to interact with. Great. Thank you. And we are actually almost at time, and there are a couple other things I wanted to make sure to cover. Those of you that are still on the call in the webinar, don't worry if we didn't get to specifically address your question. We do collect these, and our presenters have agreed to answer the questions so that we'd be able to send those back out to you in a document so you can benefit from everyone's questions and the presenters' answers. Um, before you go, it is important for us that we helped you achieve um, a learning objective. So tell us what you learned today. Go into the chat box. Tell us one thing you learned today or one thing that you're going to try to implement yourself. Oh, yes, a lot of folks are interested in trying out the app, Sandra, and a lot of folks are interested in getting contacts. Um, you will receive all of that information in follow-up emails. And it looks like a lot of folks learned a lot about the research as well. Great. And some upcoming webinars, 
and events. On the 23rd, we have a special digital literacy training tutorial for libraries. On the 29th, we're going to have a TechSoup tour. That's for folks that are new to TechSoup. And we talk about um, how to order a donated product. And then on the 31st, we have Excel for Beginners. For folks that have little to no experience in Excel but want to learn, it is an hour and a half, and there will be lots of attachments and things for you to practice as we do. So I want to thank, first of all, thank the Early Learning Lab for partnering with TechSoup. Chatel, thank you so much for putting this together and getting such a wonderful group of experts. Um, from 0 to 3. Rebecca, thank you so much. Dr. Lopez from the Harvard Family Research Project, thank you. And Sandra Gutierrez from Abriendo Puertas, Opening Doors. So um, Chatel, if there's anything else you would like to add about the upcoming webinar so folks can stay tuned. Uh, definitely. I just wanted to echo the thanks to all of our presenters for this wonderful program. And just wanted to tell the audience that the next Early Learning Lab TechSoup webinar for the field will be on teaching with technology in early learning settings, and that will be coming in June. So stay tuned for that. We'll be sending out more information about it. And um, we are also creating a microsite, um, which should be launching in April, I believe, Susan, that will be an Early Learning Lab TechSoup partnership collecting and providing resources on technology in early learning for the field. So stay tuned for that as well. Yes, we're looking forward to working on that and getting that right. Much like Sandra said, sometimes it's trial and error and feedback from folks like you on this call. So um, I do also want to send a special shout out to Becky Wiegand who has been helping out on the back end and has been my mentor in learning Ready Talk and getting used to this platform. Um, I want to thank everyone who attended today, especially those of you that are new to TechSoup. We do want you to check out our website and attend other events. One other thing, we want to thank our sponsors, ReadyTalk, for providing this platform. Again, everyone, you will receive a follow-up email with all of the resources, the PowerPoint, and a link to the recording. Thank you so much. We hope you have a great rest of your week, and we look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye.